Lord, we give you thanks that even in our weakness, you provide all things, as your word says, all things that are necessary for our life and even for the godliness that we're called to. So as we sang, our flesh may be weak, but your spirit is strong in us. Be strong in us, Lord, now as we consider your word. Open our minds and our hearts to receive it, that we would be rooted and established in your love, that we would gain insights needed to be the people we're called to be, to grow further and further into that, into that understanding, into that maturity, up into, as your word says, growing up into Christ Jesus, who is our head. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be your kingdom's people, your privilege to be a part of bringing that kingdom to bear on this earth. The privilege we have to be the extension of your love, your goodness, your righteousness to the world around us. Use this time in your word to help us to grow further into that. As we pray in the worthy name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to pull my table up here. Did you get that, Paul? I don't normally bring this over, but you notice Pastor Kevin doesn't even need it. He just leaves it over there and walks to and fro all over the place. Um, I like to have it here. It's a little bit of a security blanket. kind of hides me from my nervousness, you know. I can hide behind it if I need to. That's what the pulpit is for. So we don't have a pulpit, but we have a table, so I'll hide behind that. Well, this week we are starting a new series. We've entitled that series, My Kingdom Come. And as you might guess, uh, the kingdom suggests that we're going to, um, or the title suggests that we are going to talk about the reality that... Um, we as sinful people have at least a part of us that's bent towards building our own kingdom. And in that respect, uh, this series is related to the series uh, that we just finished um, called Only Human, where we talked about our sinful nature and all the tendencies of the sinful nature to exalt self and, and how to overcome that nature. But it's only related in that sense. Uh, it comes out of that um, because mostly this series is going to be focused on something else. It's going to be focused on what the kingdom of God is really about. There's a really um, familiar passage from Matthew's gospel uh, where the disciples ask Jesus how they are to pray. And in that familiar passage, we find what we call the Lord's Prayer. And that Lord's Prayer is given as an outline, actually, for how to pray. That's why Jesus gave it. He asked them, or they asked him, rather, how do we pray? Teach us how to pray. He gives them the Lord's Prayer. And so he starts off with the words, um, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So he exalts God. But then he goes on to these words. And this is what I want to focus on this morning. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's important for us to revisit, to understand, and to really cement in our minds and in our hearts the fact that Jesus clearly taught that the kingdom of heaven, it was God's intention to bring the kingdom of heaven to this earth. And the reason I say it's important for us to revisit that, to remind ourselves of that, to cement that in our minds and hearts, is because we tend to, to default to a thinking that has the kingdom of heaven being a place that we actually go to escape from this earth rather than something that we actually establish on this earth. Anybody relate with that? One honest guy. A few honest guys, yeah. Well, for you few, if that's your default thinking, I suspect there are more of us but at least for you few, what we hope to do in this series is really reset your default thinking so that instead of thinking of the kingdom of heaven as something we escape to, uh, to thinking of it as something we establish here 
and now. That, that is actually our purpose for being here on the earth. Everybody understands that God is all-powerful, right? <clears throat> he doesn't need us to establish the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> he could have just taken us out of the earth if it was all about a rescue, right? More on that in a minute. So God's intentions are clear, but our default thinking doesn't always line up with that. So what we hope to do is inspire you with a better understanding of what God's kingdom on earth really looks like and reset that default thinking. Now, we should begin, though, with the obvious. There are these kingdoms that are in conflict. You have God's kingdom, and then you have a kingdom or maybe kingdoms that are in conflict with God's kingdom, what God has intended. We also tend to think along the lines of what I was praying earlier uh, in a temporary mindset where we see this earth as kind of a middle ground between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of hell. We see it influenced as a middle ground by both of those kingdoms. We see sometimes very clearly the kingdoms warring against each other, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of Satan. At odds with one another here, we even see that raging inside of us, which we touched on in the last series. But we still see it as also this kind of neutral territory, like it's kind of like it's kind of like Switzerland in the in the in the combat zone, you know? Right in the middle of all of it, but neutral. But that really isn't true. And that's another way of thinking that we have to get rid of. Uh, Dr. Harry Wendt is a Lutheran scholar that I've really come to respect over the years. Um, He said it this way. He said, make no mistake, there is no neutral ground. Everything you see, there is nothing secular. Everything you see around you and all the things that you can't see around you are claimed by Almighty God and counterclaimed by the kingdom of Satan. Everything. We like the idea that we can compartmentalize our lives so that we have our spiritual life over here. That's what we do on Sundays. And we have our regular life during the rest of the week. Except for maybe we do devotions or something like that. But that's not really what Christ had in mind when he said, let's bring the kingdom of heaven here. His ministry started with repent, for the kingdom is near. Statements like that. Or the kingdom is within you. Or the kingdom is in your midst. He didn't talk about it as though it were some far-off place that we were going to be rescued to. He talked about it as a place that was being imposed on the earth. I want to read something from Isaiah chapter 14. And before I read it, I want to ask you to consider who is being addressed in this passage of Scripture. This is Isaiah 14, 12 to 15. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zephon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. What do you think? Who's being addressed here? Satan. Very good. You're right. Who else? Seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? Satan's being addressed here. And it is. You're right. What's interesting, though, is in this text in Isaiah 14... And in its parallel text, which is found in the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 28, Satan is being addressed along with the king of a kingdom called Tyre, which covered an island out off the coast of Israel and part of the inland, part of the coastland, actually, the coastland. And he had become very wealthy because he controlled a lot of the trade between kingdoms. So uh, during the time of, uh, you know, when Isaiah was, was speaking, he controlled things between superpowers like Egypt and Mesopotamia. And so he became very wealthy. Uh, he was seen as a very, very brilliant man, a uh, very, very brilliant um, businessman. Uh, and he had made himself and his people 
uh, the envy of the nations in the sense of their wealth, their opulence. He also made statements like, I will set my throne among the gods. He fancied himself a god on earth. And so the Lord told the prophet Isaiah, as he told the prophet Ezekiel, to prophesy a lament for the king of Tyre. So both the king of Tyre, a man, and Satan, according to most scholars, are being uh, addressed in these prophecies, like the one we just read. And I point that out, not just to give you a tidbit of, in, of interesting information, but rather to, to point out that there's a reason for God doing that. There's a reason that the Holy Spirit ties them together the way that he does. And that's because the kingdom of the king of Tyre and the kingdom of Satan are united. They are, in effect, one kingdom. Everything behind the mindset of the king of Tyre was satanic. And so they're united by their common heart of rebellion. But I would also point out that these stories are never told, these prophecies are never given without the desire on God's part to have us consider how we are in the story. The kingdom of humanity, the kingdom of sinful humanity is allied with, united with the kingdom of Satan so that in effect they are one kingdom. Now, that may seem odd to you. You may think to yourself, well, even in my worst sinning days, I never thought myself an ally to Satan. But remember the words of Jesus in chapter 8 of John's Gospel where he called the Jews who believed in him children of the devil. Remind yourself of the words when Jesus said, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit to anyone who asks? Make no mistake, God understands, we should understand, that it's in terms of our sinful nature, we are in alliance, we are unified in our desire to build our own kingdom, in our sin, to build our own kingdom without God. Maybe even some of our default thinking that sees heaven as a place to escape this earth from, maybe even some of that has to do with building the kingdom the way we want to, even though we're saved. Those of us who believe in Christ, we are destined for heaven. But you can see the struggle taking place in obvious ways and sometimes not so obvious, more subtle ways. This desire to build our own kingdom. And that's always been true of the kingdoms of the earth. In fact, there is a story given to us in the very beginning of the Bible. There are several stories told in the beginning of the Bible. Uh, this is from chapter 11 in Genesis this is the familiar story for a lot of people of the Tower of Babel. So I want to read through that and point out some interesting things about it. In verse 1, it starts off, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to where? To the heavens. So that, here's the reason, we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. So this is a story that really applies to humanity. It's not a story um, about a specific people united after a global flood trying to build their city and make a name for themselves, so to speak. It's really about humanity. In fact, the, the idea that all people had one language, um, all spoke a common tongue, that conveys the idea of what unites us, what, what brings us in community is our ability, unique community, is our ability to have language, to understand one another, right? Other animals don't have the same level of ability that human beings do in communicating with each other, and so they cannot do the things that human beings can do. And so God in this story 
uh, sees, their, sees them reaching their potential apparently before he thinks it's healthy for them to do that. And so in the story, he comes down, he looks at what's occurring, and decides that he has to take away their ability to work together in that way. Now, if you understand the character of God, then you understand that he's doing that out of love. He doesn't want them working together that way because it must be before it would be healthy for them to do that. They are in a place of their understanding, and they are united for wrong reasons. This is true of the kingdoms of humanity throughout our human history with one hiccup, one very important hiccup in that history. And what we see happening, every time humanity manages to rally around the common cause to make a name for themselves, by the way, in ancient cultures, that's more than just deciding, I want to be called Joe. Instead, when they, say, when they talk about the name, they're talking about who they are and what they're about. It is, it's so central to their identity. It, it's the symbol of who they are and what they're about. It's very, very important. The concept of a name isn't just about a label. It's about what they are. And what they want to be in this story are people that ascend to the gods. Maybe even some of that intention was noble. Maybe not. We don't know. But they want to ascend to be godlike. And that's true of humanity, as we spoke in the last series. We have this desire to usurp the authority of God to actually be our own gods, to be the masters of our destiny. And because of that nature, we naturally don't typically unite because the base of, our, of that sinful nature is what? What-centered? Self-centered. But they will rally around a common cause. Have you ever heard the, uh, the statement, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend? When the kingdoms of humanity unite, it's usually because they're united around a common cause to exalt their humanity, usually over other people, at least in the front, on the surface of things usually to exalt themselves. You know, Nazi Germany, for example, believed, its leadership believed that they had a superior race to all others, that they needed to establish that superior race in rulership over the rest of the world. The Romans thought the same thing. The Greeks thought the same thing. The Persians thought the same thing. The Babylonians thought the same thing. Unite, rise to exalt our humanity, inevitably what? Unite around a common cause to exalt our humanity. We rise up to do that. Inevitably, we fall. Because it's always exalting our humanity without who? Without God. Every single time. All of these kingdoms, you'll notice as you look at your history books, were built on the rules of this world. The rules of evolution. The rules of the kingdom of hell. They're built on oppression. They're built on fear. We keep you in line because you are afraid of us. You serve us because you are afraid of us. You feel inferior to us because you are afraid of us. They're always built on the same thing. I'll give you some examples. Even the classical um, civilizations that we refer to as the, the beginnings of Western civilization, like the Greeks, we think of them as much more highly civilized than the barbarian world around them. And in a lot of ways, that's absolutely true. And there were a lot of great things that came out of those civilizations that we see as foundations for our own. But here's the reality. If you were to get into a time, uh, a, a time traveling some kind of vehicle and you were to uh, jettison back in time to the, to the classical periods uh, when the ancient Greeks we're really having a lot of influence, you would be appalled. I don't care how mean-spirited you are. You would be appalled at how this civilization treated each other in many ways. Yes, there were laws against the murder of the innocent and so on, unless they were unwanted innocent, like the lame or unwanted children. Those were just simply disposed of in many Greek city-states. In fact, the Spartans, which was a military state and one of the most respected of all of them, even after Athens had gained prominence and Alexander the Great was king, Sparta was left to their own political, um, they, were, they had their own political system. They were allowed to run themselves. 
They never directly went to war with Sparta because they were afraid of Sparta, okay? Anybody see the movie 300? Some of that's pretty accurate, you know? Um, they were unbelievable warriors. Well, here's the reason. If you were a male in that society, by the time you were seven years old, you were taken from your parents and raised by the military. Seven years old. Then when you hit puberty, they took you into the temple of Artemis and they flogged you to see if you could continue to become a man, depending on how well you took that flogging. We think of things like that today and we're like, what? That's insane. I mean, imagine my son Joseph being taken away from us at seven years old, adopted by the military at seven years old, and then as he enters puberty, being flogged in some temple to make sure that he's still going to continue to be a man. And what if he doesn't? Well, then he's despised in the society. He ends up like the others that are despised in society. If they're not disposed of, they're just disregarded. They beg in the streets. Of course, you didn't get far doing that. These people always died young. I could go on and on and on with the barbaric treatment, even in the classical civilizations that with which they treated those people that didn't measure up to, to the ideal image of humanity, which, was trying, which they were trying to exalt to deity. The list goes on and on. Even Moses, the great lawgiver of the Bible, it's recorded. The Bible doesn't shy away from these things. Moses, after God uses the Israelites to judge the Midianites, in military conquest, Moses sees them coming back with all the goods, all the women and the children, and he's angry that he brought the women and children with them. And he says to the leaders of the soldiers, you brought all these women and children with you? Kill them all. Murder them all. Oh, except the virgins. You can keep the virgins for yourselves. even Moses. This is the way the world was. I say this is the way the world was for a reason. But I'll get to that in a minute. I'm going to give you a, a fantastic, just really fascinating uh, snapshot, prophetic snapshot from the prophet Daniel in chapter 2. Uh, and this is a place in that book that records um, a dream that the king of that time in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, had. And it was a dream that really disturbed him. So much so that he called all of his wise men together and said, I want you guys to interpret this dream and tell me what it means. But because he suspected that very often what they told him was just what he wanted to hear, he, he decided to test them. He said, but before, I, before you give me the interpretation, I want you to actually tell me what it was that I dreamt. As you can imagine, none of them could do that. They thought it was outrageous. They, you know, they protested as much as they could without having their heads cut off. And he said, listen, you've got this many days. If you don't bring somebody to me that can tell me what my dream was and then interpret it, you're all going to die. That's how, that's how worthwhile I think you are. Well, Daniel heard about this, and Daniel prayed, and God gave him the dream. And so Daniel saves the day. He comes and he tells the king, or the king's official, tell the king, I know the dream. And this is where we're picking up where he explains that dream. Or he doesn't explain it, but he gives the dream to the king. It says, Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. He then goes on after the king says, Wow, that's exactly what I dreamt. He goes on then to interpret it. This is what he said. I'm going to paraphrase that for time's sake. He said, uh, you, O king, are the gold head because your kingdom was like no other. 
There will be a kingdom, though, that supplants you. That is the silver kingdom. The, uh, the bronze kingdom is a kingdom that will then come after that one and supplant it. And the iron legs are a kingdom that is stronger than all the rest and will smash all of them. And the feet are made up of the remnants of that kingdom and its influence and um, parts that will be strong, parts that are very frail and brittle and weak. You and I, in school, read about each one of these kingdoms in our world history classes. The first kingdom, of course, is the Babylonian kingdom. Then was the Medo-Persian kingdom, followed by Alexander the Great in the Greek kingdom, followed by the Roman kingdom, and arguably, the feet are the ailing Roman uh, Empire uh, as it began to be weakened by weak parts, which is definitely true in its history. Some scholars would even say that we are part of that empire. That's debatable, but um, we're definitely influenced by it because we are the Western influence, and that influence is spreading. Here's the thing. What's interesting about this prophecy is the rock that is cut out, but not by human hands. So if it's not cut out by human hands, then who did cut it out? God, right. And it comes, and it smashes what part of the statue? The feet, where there are the weak and brittle parts. Then the rest of the statue comes down, right? So you understand that all of these kingdoms are simply representative of humanity's effort, again, to unite, rise up to exalt its humanity, inevitably they fall. But here in this dream, Nebuchadnezzar sees and Daniel interprets that it is God who ultimately brings the fall of man's attempts to usurp him. He'll bring him. Now, a simple reading of that text might lead you to believe that the way that God does that is he smashes it all to bits. But it's not really the way he does it. It's actually much more brilliant. Instead, what God does is he attacks the weak parts of that empire, the part that just can't stay united. Baked clay and iron, if you don't know this, they don't stay together. And that's because of our nature as sinful human beings. And so this kingdom was doomed to fail without God at its center. And so what happens is in the midst of that kingdom, as it was already entering into uh, a time of weakness, where they were fighting wars on all fronts and they were spread out very far and wide, um, in a very obscure little place in Palestine called Bethlehem, a spy infiltrated the enemy's camp. The spy was baby Jesus. This is the brilliance of God. He infiltrates the enemy's camp in a way that would only be likened to one of our spies actually being born and raised in Russia, a devoted citizen of the Russian nation, who then is also just as devoted to America. That's Jesus in the incarnation. So Jesus comes. He infiltrates the, human, the, uh, the, the enemy's camp, rather, and the impact of his teachings have been felt ever since, his life and his teachings influencing humanity, um, so much so that for the most part, all of humanity recognizes a calendar of human history that's divided into two parts, A.D., Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord, and B.C., before Christ. This baby Jesus grows up to be a carpenter in this little corner of the Roman Empire that hardly anybody knows anything about. He only ministers for three years, but the, the, the influence of his life and his teachings are so powerful, though they are incredibly, um, what's the word, non-intuitive to us in our nature, they're so powerful and effective that humanity is forever changed as soon as it happens. I'll give you an example of things that have influenced the world concerning Jesus. The teachings of Jesus are foundational to our jurisprudence. Laws that require equality and justice for all people, that comes from the concepts that Jesus Christ gave us. Laws that required providing for the poor, that comes from Jesus. 
Christians were the motivating force behind women's right to vote. Who knew? But they were. Christianity is the force behind equality and care for the disabled of society. That comes from Jesus. William Wilberforce, anybody know who that is? He, um, his, it was his conversion and his devotion to Jesus Christ that led him and motivated him to work for the liberation of slaves everywhere and to work for, for laws. This is what most people don't know, that he also worked hard to establish laws that abolish child labor. The love of Jesus, so that's the influence of Jesus on our jurisprudence uh, system. The love of Jesus inspired great movements of compassion also in the world that the world had never seen before. Nothing like this had ever been seen before Jesus Christ came to infiltrate the enemy's camp. It, during the Great Plagues, for example, uh, from Roman times all the way into the Middle Ages, um, it, were, it was the Christians only who risked everything to take care of the sick and the dying. Risked everything because it was contagious. Many of them died taking care of the sick and dying. The vast majority of nonprofit hospitals, in fact, were motivated by people who love Jesus. The vast majority of nonprofit hospitals today in the United States, it's something like 80% of them are Christian in their foundation. Isn't that amazing? The Red Cross was begun by a devout Christian, Henry Dunant. Some of you have heard us tell his story before. The Salvation Army, of course, begun by Christians to take care of the poor, um, the addicted, the, uh, the down and outs of society. Mission shelters, soup kitchens, and virtually every single community in this nation anyway sponsored mostly by Christians to disperse Christian mercy and compassion. Habitat for Humanity, we all know about them. They build homes, they also have a prison fellowship that ministers to imprisoned outcasts of society. I found an interesting quote by a French statement whose name I really have difficulty uh, pronouncing, Alex de Tocqueville, I don't know. Uh, he came to this country though in the early 1800s. This is what he saw. He was startled by the volunteerism that was carried out by associations mostly founded and run by Christians and said that America's volunteer spirit is without a doubt its greatest strength. He went on to say that he did not know 10 men in all of France who would do what ordinary Americans do every day as a matter of course. That is the inspiration of Jesus Christ among the American people. The pragmatic power of Jesus' teachings simply work when they are applied to everyday life. Jesus' teachings promote, of course, healthy relationships, strong marriages, honest business practices, positive parenting, racial reconciliation, cultural kindness, champion the value and dignity of all humans regardless of creed, race, sex, nationality, or orientation. And while you hear often that the divorce rate among Christians is almost equal to that of the world, here's the reality. There have been other studies done. That is true among nominal Christians, that is, those who call themselves Christians. But here's another study. Those who take their faith seriously, and it was measured by um, devotional practices that are regular in the week, um, prayer, regular prayer, regular uh, church attendance, and praying with and for one another. Here's the stats. Catholic families were 31% less likely to divorce than the rest of the world. And Protestants were 35% less likely to divorce. So the march of his kingdom is taking place despite what a lot of our default thinking is. It continues. And we read earlier the story of the Tower of Babel where the people there are dispersed by the confusing of their languages, right? But I want to point something out that's really fascinating. Jesus, before he ascends, he promises to send who in his place? The Holy Spirit. The day that the Holy Spirit arrives after Jesus' ascension is the day that we call Pentecost. Anybody remember what happened at Pentecost? People spoke... Yes, in various languages, we heard them speaking in our own tongues. The day that we call Pentecost is the day that God united people through language. What God was in effect saying that day is that the curse of division that you have suffered for all these millennia 
has come to an end. It's broken. The kingdom of God and his Christ has come. The curse of Babel is broken. The kingdom of heaven has come. You know, often I hear Christians speaking, and I do this myself, of the good old days, as though it's some kind of golden age, never to be realized again. We tend to remember our past with rose-colored glasses. That's the reality. We watch the news, and because what sells is what is broadcast, we see news filled with murders, theft, corruption, and injustice of all kinds. And sometimes we're even duped into feeling like we live in a world that is just so completely dark that we can't do anything about it, as if it's some kind of black hole that's just ready to swallow us up if we go anywhere near it, much less if we actually try to shine any light in it. It'll even swallow up that light. This is the attitude that's been popularized even in some Christian literature, which remains unnamed. A view of the church that has her hunkered down, cowering from the darkness, waiting for King Jesus to come and rescue her. And no matter what your view is of the end of human history, no matter what your perception, right or wrong, is of the world and all the evil in it, no matter whether you think it is more evil than ever or maybe not, this you can know for certain, we are never ever, ever called to be a church that hunkers down and waits for the rescue. That, you can be sure, is a lie that hell is all too willing to watch us believe. Instead, we are the church. This offensive force that Jesus describes as so powerful that even the gates of hell cannot withstand its onslaught. We are called to an offensive strike against that kingdom. We are called, yes, to take care of the poor, in which we do that. To feed the hungry, we do that. But we're not only called to that, you understand, we're called to dismantle, to take apart a world system that allows for the degradation of masses of people and even the starvation of millions and backbreaking poverty for millions more for the sake of a tiny minority who live in unbelievable opulence at the expense of the rest. We are called as the Church of Jesus Christ to dismantle that system. We're going to talk more about that in this series. We are not called to hunker down as a defeated people waiting to be rescued. We're never called to that. We're called to wield a sword, the sword of the Spirit. We're called to wield the love of Christ. We're called to feed the hungry, take care of the poor, but dismantle the world that allows for that injustice. We're called to live and love our enemies so long as the peace depends on us. We are, with Christ, co-inheritors to the kingdom of heaven. That's what we're called. But we are also called to co-labor in the building of it. We are, in that prophecy that Daniel gave, in that dream that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed, you understand we are the mountain spreading to fill the whole earth. We are that mountain if we choose to be. So let's choose wisely because the mountain is filling the earth regardless of what we think and regardless of our participation. Jesus said to the unbelieving in his day, and I'll close with this, he said, therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Does that sound like he wants them to hunker down? Or does he want them to produce? Anyone who falls on this stone, referring to himself, will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. I don't know about you. I don't want to be crushed. I don't know about you. I choose to fall on Christ. 
And to be broken, yes, to be broken. But also to be remade, you understand, and united with the advancing kingdom of my God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, grant us repentance, just as you said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Grant us repentance where that is needed, to have eyes that see things for what they really are and not what we think they should be, or what we've been duped into thinking they are. Lord, give us hearts that are filled with courage, hearts that produce the fruit of the kingdom of God. Reset our thinking, Lord, so that we are not defaulting to a thinking that is defeated right from the beginning, <laughs> that even sees the world as something more powerful than it really is, or Satan's kingdom for something more powerful than it is. Help us to see, Lord, that we are the victorious nation of Jesus Christ. We are the victorious people of the kingdom of heaven. We are the people empowered by the very presence of the living God who gave us all things to live out our godliness here, gave us gifts to be used, love to be given, lives to be spent. To advance this kingdom of love. Help us, Lord, in this series to see the beauty of your kingdom, the kingdom that you've inspired, the kingdom that you have intended, the kingdom that will come to bear, crushing all that is in its way, or breaking up and remaking all that would submit and fall upon the rock who is Christ Jesus, to be united with that mountain that is filling the earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for